Hello, everyone. Um, so let's start. Um, my name is uh, Sébastien Tremblay, and I will be giving you a talk on how to decode brain signals using support vector machines. Uh, so I'm a PhD student in the Julio Martinez Trujillo's lab in the Department of Physiology. And uh, in that lab, we uh, try to study prefrontal cortex function and how it implements some sort of filtering mechanism, um, filtering out behaviorally irrelevant information and uh, filtering in uh, behaviorally relevant information, what we call selective attention. And um, we use non-human primates to do so. And um, um, in cognitive neurophysiology, um, in the field of cognitive neurophysiology, the field that we're in, um, people have been using, so scientists have been using mainly um, single neuron recording techniques where they lower a single electrode in the brain of an experimental animal and try to record uh, action potentials, potentials from single cells. And they've been doing so to try to infer how populations of neurons, how the brain works, right? So how many neurons work when they work um, together. And, and there's a problem with that, at least, at least two, two main problems. Um, so to do, to do that, um, the scientists have been recording single units and they've been pooling the activity of these single units across many trials, okay? So two problems here. First, um, the brain has to make decisions based on single events. So when you guys are making saccades to the different, different objects on the screens or just deciding to pay attention to one, to one feature or one another, um, all of this happens very quickly, right? So uh, your brain doesn't average um, over repeated a presentation of the same slide or of the same situation to make that decision. It needs to happen instantaneously, okay? And to do so, the brain needs to recruit the activity of multiple neurons uh, and not just one single neuron, okay? So the first point here is when the brain makes decision, makes th those decisions stand instantly. So recording from single neurons and averaging over multiple trials, that's not a very, uh, very um, ecologically valid way of trying to understand how brain function is, works, okay? Um, the second, the second, um, the second point here is that um, neurons that you record in the brain they do not work in solo. Okay, they they work with all these other neurons around, and um, they likely covariate together. Okay, uh, even when the same situation, when the, the the brain faces the same environmental situation, the same stimulus condition, the same input, um, likely there will be some variances in uh, some variance in the. Uh, in the activity of these neurons, and this variance can be correlated, uh, and that's what we call in the field noise correlations. So what these noise correlations do actually is um, they kind of lead to an overestimation of the information content of a population code. Uh, when you pool over a lot of neurons and you assume all these neurons to be independent predictors of what is the stimulus presented on the screen, let's say, um, then um, if you assume all these neurons to be independent predictors while they really are not independent but they co-vary together, um, then that will lead to this overestimation of the information content. Just like if you had to, um, let's say you're, you're trying to figure out if that's a, there's a, this new movie out and you want to know if it's a good movie, then you have two, two, two choices. You have either a group of friends which all went to see the movie alone and you ask them alone whether they like the movie or not, that would be one, option one, and option two would be you have this group of friends with like a despotic leader within the group. They all went to see the movie together, and then after they talked about the movie, and they, you know, they they, they build up their opinion that way. So which which one, which group of friend would you prefer to go ask uh, to get the best estimate of whether that's really a good movie or maybe not, right? Uh, probably the, the first group of friend because they all are independent predictors of it's if it's a good movie or not. The other one they're probably under the influence of the opinion of this leader. Uh, so their opinion co-vary, right? So there's less information of that group of individual than in the first group of individual. Um, so to, to uh, overcome these two limitations, there is kind of this paradigm shift right now in neuroscience. I mean, it's not really actual, but it's been there for at least a decade. Um, for, to going from one single neuron recorded over many trial, traditional approach, to recording many neurons uh, over a single trial and to try to um, get a better idea, a better um, ecological validity in the research that, uh, that we do, at least uh, in Julio's lab. So um, to do that, uh, we need to record the activity of multiple neurons simultaneously. How do you do that? Uh, in the lab, what we use are multi-electrode arrays, which are um, arrays of 96 independent channels, 
um, that um, are chronically implanted in this on the surface of uh, of the brain on the cortex. In our case, on on the prefrontal cortex, and uh, these small uh, multi-channel arrays allow us to sample the simultaneous activity of ensembles of cells, okay, that are working together at the same time, doing maybe the same task, or at least contributing to the same task. And this is what we work with now to try to, um, to, try to understand how the brain filters information on an instantaneous basis or to make decisions on an instantaneous basis. Um, so on the right side here, you see kind of an a example recording what it looks like. You have a whole bunch of single neurons uh, firing action potential simultaneously. And uh, that's what we need to analyze now. So that leads to to a new problem, at least in our lab, um, uh, which is how are we supposed to interpret this massive amount of data? Um, so we used to be doing single units, uh, single unit recording. We used to use um, certain computational tools like ROC, receiver operating characteristic curves, to try to understand how single neurons detect stimulus or not. But some, most of these approaches are not fit to extracting the additional information that's contained in a population code in the simultaneous activity, okay? If we use these, um, these traditional computational tools, then we lose this additional information that we sought to gain by recording simultaneously from ensembles of neurons. Um, so um, luckily, we are not the first one facing this problem. Some people have uh, tried to come up with, uh, with answers, and I want to I wanna suggest one very good read that at least helped me to, to understand uh, to get a better understanding of, of how to interpret neural population codes. Uh, this paper by uh, Juan Quiroga in Nature Review Neuroscience 2009, um, which um, points out w first what are the, the reasons that, you would, uh, y that should motivate you to record from population of neurons rather than single neurons, and second, how, what are the two main approaches to do so, at least to, to interpret these, these population codes. So, Two of them here. Um, one of them uh, is decoding, and decoding refers to um, trying to um, figure out what's the input or what's the output of a biological system given a certain neuronal response, given a certain assemble activity. When I talk about assemble, I, I mean an assemble of neurons that are acting together, that are working together. Um, so decoding would be. Uh, for example, I'm looking at a, a, a population activity and I am trying to figure out, let's say, what is it that the participant or uh, the monkey is seeing on the screen. Is he seeing uh, a house or is he, is he seeing a tower? Is he seeing a face? Um, so this is the type of predictions that decoding will try to do, um, give you the best estimate of what is it that the monkey is, what is it, what's the sensory input to the monkey's brain or what's, let's say, the uh, motor output, okay, whatever. You'll just try to come up with the most likely prediction given a certain neural activity pattern. And the other, uh, the other um, approach is the information uh, theoretic approach, which tries to quantify the amount of information contained in a population, okay, in a population of neuron. Um, so um, this uses many different metrics like uh, Shannon's information, entropy, um, and I'm not going to be talking in this talk about information theory. I'll focus on, uh, on decoding, okay? Um, so what is decoding? What's the general logic of it? Um, so first, uh, you record from uh, multiple neurons uh, simultaneously. Let's say in that, in that example, we record from two neurons, neuron, neuron one and neuron two. And uh, we are presenting two different uh, uh, stimuli on the screen. Um, and each of these two neurons have preferred, uh, prefer a preferred stimulus, okay? Um, so let's say that here, uh, neuron one uh, prefers the stimulus tower. So here, that's time, and this is stimulus onset. Um, so uh, in the case, in case here uh, uh, of neuron one, he fires a lot after a tower is presented, uh, but neuron one doesn't really like that stimulus, doesn't fire there. And neuron two here um, fires after the onset of a spider, but not after a tower, okay? So these two neurons have different tuning. Um, this is what you usually found in the brain, uh, a whole bunch of neurons tuned to different types of features, at least in prefrontal cortex. Well, in uh, many different parts of cortex, actually. Um, so you have these two neurons. You record them simultaneously, and then um, you present these stimulus over multiple trials, okay? Uh, just like we usually do, uh, even with single neurons, uh, single unit recording. 
And what you want to do then is plot, um, plot th both of these neurons' activity on, uh, on a graph uh, where, whereby each axis represents the firing rate of one neuron. So in that example, we have two neurons. So we have two axes, and um, each of these axes represent the firing rate of a given neuron. If, let's say, we'd have three neurons, then um, we'd have three axes there, and it, this would be a three-dimensional plot, okay? Um, so each dot here is a, for a, is a given trial, okay? So let's say that uh, in that trial, um, neuron one fired 32 spikes, and uh, neuron two fired um, close to zero spikes, okay? So you plot all of these trials, and um, then you need to give some information to your to your decoder. Okay, you need to. That's the supervised part of the of the decoding, where you s you tell uh, you tell the truth to your decoder. You say, well, uh, you know, all these trials there, um, they belong to that decoder. Okay, a tower was presented. Okay, so you you, you teach your decoder uh, some some association between uh, the environment, um, the stimulus presentation and the neural activity, okay? So you teach the decoder a few of these associations. So these belong to that situation, these belong to that stimulus condition, okay? So now your decoder is what we call trained, and um, then what you can do once your uh, decoder is trained is try to decode. Um, that means that when there is a new trial coming up, let's say this gray dot here, uh, whereby you don't tell the decoder which uh, condition it belongs to, um, then you can try to predict um, from the model of the associations between the response and the, the, the external world, you try to predict what's the most likely category um, of stimulus that um, this trial uh, belongs to. What is it presented on the screen when we observe such a neuronal response? So then there are different ways that you can try to infer that, um, different decoding techniques. One of them would be nearest neighbor, very simple one. Um, that Data point, which which is which is uh, the nearest uh, neighbor neighboring category? Is it this one or this one? Well, distance between this and this is smaller than distance between this and this, and so we'll assign this dot to being blue, and we will assume that the most likely stimulus presented on the screen at that moment is a tower and not a spider. Another way to do so would actually to be uh, to draw a margin between these two categories. So let's try to fit a line so that uh, we maximize uh, the separation between, uh, between all these, these two dots, uh, these two uh, clouds of dots. And so if we have a new dot that comes in, um, depending on which side of the margin this dot falls on, we'll associate, um, we'll associate this dot to the specific, uh, the specific category uh, belonging to that side of the margin. So there are many different ways that we can, that we can take that decision uh, about what is it um, how we should interpret that, uh, the, n the given neural activity, um, given, is, uh, given a, a, new, uh, a new data point. Um, so you've trained your decoder. Um, now you've made some predictions. Uh, yeah? Huh? Well, you, it, you, you hope that it doesn't fall exactly on the diagonal, and then you can always look at finer resolutions and find out it doesn't actually fit exactly on the diagonal and then assign it to to uh to, <laughs> to the side uh yeah so this is this is just a a decision boundary right um i mean it's purely mathematic here um and i i would say uh well with a given resolution you'll always be able to make that decision okay uh well if you have a very good resolution you'll always be able to make the decision okay the point will never fit exactly on the line okay um, so, um, so you've trained your decoder, um, uh, thought in a few associations between neuronal response patterns and the world, and uh, this decoder has um, yielded a few predictions about what, it, what is the external world given a few, uh, g given a neural uh, activity pattern, and then what you want to do is to you want to try to um, test uh, the accuracy of the decoder, okay? Um, and one way to do so is um, well, one way to represent um, uh, this performance, this accuracy of prediction, is through a confusion matrix that you see on the on the right side here. Okay, and um, so what this confusion matrix um, depicts is uh, first on one axis 
uh, let's say that in a given experiment we have 32 different stimulus that can be presented to the monkey, and um, so each line represents a given stimulus presented. That's the real that's the real state of the world, and here that's what uh, your decoder predicts about the state of the world. Okay, so what you would expect if your decoder is perfectly accurate, you would you would expect to have entries only on the diagonal, which means that well, when stimulus 30 is presented on the screen. Well, that's what your predictor, uh, that's what your decoder has predicted, that it was actually uh, that stimulus presented on the screen. So um, diagonal terms, that's what you want. But of course, your decoders will make some mistake, and these are um, off-diagonal terms. And uh, so these off-diagonal terms, um, they might appear random, uh, randomly distributed, but sometimes they're, they're not randomly distributed. Sometimes your decoder makes very systematic errors. Let's say that um, in two, two stimulus, you have uh, a spider here, and you have some other insect here on the right, right side, right? So a lot of features are similar, so then your decoder will mostly, will, you know, m more probably confuse these two pictures than, uh, you know, a, a spider and an insect rather than a spider and a tower, okay? So some, some, some mistakes are, uh, are systematic, they're not random, and th the confusion matrix can show you some of that, okay, when you look at it, okay? So this is one, one uh, classical way of depict uh, depicting uh, the accuracy uh, of a decoder. It's 35 different uh, samples here. Oh. Yes. Okay. Sorry. So here, picture presented. That's so. Let's say we have a, a, a database of 30, 35 different images. Okay, um, and we're trying to use this decoder to predict which one of these 35 is presented on a screen given a certain uh, assemble population uh, response. Okay. Um, so yeah. So we. So you, what you want to do after you've trained your decoder, you want to test the accuracy of your of your decoder, okay? So that's important. That's what will tell you whether your, your decoder is doing a good job or not, if you should rely on uh, the predictions made by your decoder. That's, that's clear, yeah? All right. Um, so there are a lot of different decoders, okay? Um, a lot of different uh, ways you can make this decision. I've shown you two, nearest neighbor, margin. Um, so in our lab, we, we, we try to study a prefrontal cortex, which is, um, a region that seems to be doing a lot of a lot of different things, and uh, it's pretty hard for us to uh, um, to uh, associate given neuronal response to very specific features that are uh, static, non-changing across different conditions. Seems like prefrontal cortex does a different thing depending on what's what's the task at hand. Um, so, um, some class classifiers are better suited than others at dealing with that type of information. Okay, um, and um, some people have actually. Uh, try to figure out which is the best decoder to um, try to um, uh, extract information from a population of prefrontal uh, neurons. And it seems like support vector machine that outperforms most of these other classifiers that are, that are out there, okay? So that's one justification why I will be presenting um, to you how support vector machine works. And I will be giving you an example on how to use support vector machine to uh, decode uh, a uh, sample of uh, a pop uh, prefrontal cortex neuronal assemblies activity, okay? Um, all right, so uh, support vector machine. Um, it's been out there for about 20 years now, okay? That's the original paper that presented this uh, mathematical framework. Um, most recently, there has been a, uh, an implementation of support vector machine called LibSVM, okay? Uh, that's that's what I'll be uh, talking about specifically today. That's uh, a toolbox that you can use with MATLAB um, to uh, to conduct uh, support vector machine decoding. Um, this toolbox has been extremely popular. It's been out only since 2011, and if you use Google Scholar to try to see how many times it's been cited, um, you see that just in neuroscience it's been cited more than 2,000 times. Okay. And more than 13,000 times in science in general. So it's been very popular. It's been doing a very, very good job uh, at classifying stuff. Um, so um, the general principle of support vector machine. Um, so classification implies separating different category of data points. So here we have the red data points and we have the green data points here. It's pretty hard to come with a single margin that will optimally separate green dots from uh, green squares from red dots. Um, so in a low dimension, like this, let's say, is a two-dimensional plot, 
it's very hard to find that margin. But some problems are easier to solve in a higher dimensional space. So if, let's say, we transfer this two-dimensional plot to a three-dimensional plot, it's pretty easy to find an hyperplane that optimally separates the red dots from the green squares. Okay? So this is what support vector machine does when it uses what we call the kernel trick to project a low dimensionality data set into a high dimensionality um, uh, space to try to solve this problem uh, in an easier way, okay? Solve this problem of classification in an easier way. The number of dimensions of the input space uh, is equal to the number of neurons in a session, okay? So with that example I've given at the very beginning, I had only two neurons and two axes. I told you that if I would have added a, a third neurons, then it would be a three-dimensional plot. So there's no limit to that, okay? We can go four, five, six, ten, fifty dimensions, okay? So it's hard to imagine a fifty-dimensional plot, but MATLAB can do that pretty easily. Um, and um, so the input space um, has a number of axes or number of dimensions that's equal to the number of neurons, every neuron being a different predictor. Um, and then you can jump from that low dimensional input space to an even higher dimensional space using this kernel trick, okay? So you project data in an even higher dimensional space in which it is possible to find an hyperplane that optimally separates the data. And then you want to position this hyperplane uh, in a way that you maximize the distance between uh, dots of the different categories, okay? So you want these dots here are called the support vector. That's where the name comes from, support vector machine. And um, they, you, you want to try to position your, your hyperplane so you maximize the distance between the support vectors, okay? Um, so the margin between the plane and the support vectors is maximized. So that's the kind of general uh, logic of how support vector machine uh, works, okay? Um, if, you want a more, if you want more details about the mathematics behind it, there, there's an expert right there. <laughs> it's complex, okay? Uh, yeah, so how you do, how you conduct multi-class SVM, that's, that's your question, right? Um, so, I, yeah, yeah, so yes, so the, the quick answer is yes, and I will be giving you an example of multi-class SVM, where I'll be uh, classifying four different types, four different types of data. Yes. Um, okay, so I'll go um, through an example now, okay? So I've put on the website um, a, uh, a toolbox. Uh, did anybody of you try to download this toolbox? Please raise your hand. Yeah? Okay, one. <laughs> did, you, did you successfully install the toolbox? You, okay, you didn't get that far. <laughs> You've downloaded it. That's step one. All right, good. Because it, okay, cool. So I've put on the website um, a zip file uh, which contains uh, pretty much all you need to do what exactly I'll be doing right now, okay? It contains the libsvm toolbox. It contains uh, a in detailed installation procedure on how to install the toolbox. It seems like it's not that easy to install depending on whether, what's your machine? Is it a Mac? Is it a PC? What's the version of it? But I'm giving at least a detailed instruction if you have that given Mac with a given MATLAB version. Um, and it's actually very uh, much easier in the PC. You don't need to compile um, uh, the, the, the MEX files. Um, so um, in that toolbox, um, uh, there, are, there is also a sample data set from the actual data that I'm, that I'm working with, which is uh, a data set uh, recorded from prefrontal cortex of a macaque monkey um, with a bunch, a bunch of simultaneously recorded units, around 50. 50 units uh, simultaneously recorded using one of these multi-electrode arrays while the monkey is actually performing a, uh, a selective attention task, okay? So what I'll do right now and what you can do at home if you download the, the toolbox is to, to do exactly what I'll be doing here, which is to classify where in space the monkey is allocating attention depending on the population activity. And that's what, what I'll do right now, okay? So just to give you a general sense of what's the task that the monkey had to, had to perform, um, um, well, so, so this is first the, the region of it, the implant, okay? Um, uh, that's, uh, that's called region 8A um, in uh, the prefrontal cortex, just anterior to the arcuate sulcus. Um, 
and yeah, so that's that, that's the uh, uh, little picture of what's the array that's implanted there. Um, so the monkey had to um, was seated in front of a computer screen, um, um, and by pressing lever and fixating a central spot, so monkey always maintained fixation on that central cross. Um, then a cue would appear, okay, a cue grating stimulus would appear, and that would instruct the monkey to allocate attention to that part of the visual field. Um, so represented here by this, uh, this orange circle. Um, but then further after the cue, um, distractors appear, distractor stimuli um, that are exactly identical to, uh, to the target stimuli. This is not present, so the monkey has to allocate attention to the same, to the same stimuli, and nothing is really telling the monkey that this is the target stimuli apart from uh, what was previously presented. And then he needs to detect a quick uh, change in the orientation of one of the grading in order to make a saccade to that grading in a very, uh, in a very short time. Um, so that's basically the task. It's an attentional task because the monkey during a certain delay period has to filter out uh, distracting uh, visual information and to focus on a, given, uh, on a given visual target. So during that delay, uh, the selection process is undergoing in prefrontal cortex, and uh, this, is what, uh, this is the time period that I will be analyzing right now uh, with you. So um, when, you, um, when you want to use um, libSVM to conduct that type of classification, you need first to organize your data in a specific format, okay? That format is pretty simple. Um, it's, uh, it's a trial by neuron matrix, okay? So what you want to do in MATLAB, okay, so everything here is in MATLAB. If you don't know how to use MATLAB, you, got, you gotta know how to use MATLAB, uh, <laughs> just for for ha sake of happiness. And um, so um, each row is a different trial, okay, of different stimulus condition, different experimental condition. We don't care about that right now, okay? So let's say you, across your entire session, the monkey did 200 trial. Well, okay, so you have 200 lines here, 200 rows. And every column is a different neuron, okay? So in the example here, I think I have 54 different neurons recorded simultaneously, so I have 54 different columns. And every entry is a firing rate for a given neuron in a given trial, okay? So trial by neuron matrix, that's what you need. Uh, in the toolbox that I've given you, uh, this matrix is called example SVM input dot mat, okay? Actually, there are two fields into that structure. This is one field. The second field contains your label information, okay? That contains the information about where is it that attention was actually allocated, because remember, you need to train your decoder, right? So you need at some point to teach the decoder an association between a given neuronal pattern, ac activity pattern, and the true state of the world, okay? So you need to tell what's the true state of the world to your decoder, at least for this training phase, okay? So here there are four possible um, conditions. Um, condition one is that the monkey's allocating attention to the upper left target, and then two, three, four, four different possible uh, spaces of the visual field uh, that the monkey can allocate attention to. So these are my four different classes, four different categories. Uh, would be, that would be the, the, the green squares and the red dots and uh, the blue triangles and so on in, in the previous depiction that I've shown you, okay? Um, so the second field of that uh, SVM input matrix is a field uh, tri uh, with trial by condition. No, actually there's only two. So there's only two columns, okay? First column is trial. Um, so you have all your trials here. And the second one is the condition, so one, two, three, four. So trial one, attention was allocated in the upper left quadrant of the screen, and so on, okay? So you, of course you need to have the same amount of rows um, in that structure as you have in that structure. It's very important, okay? All right, so that, that's how you need to format your data to use libSVM. It's not too complicated so far, okay? I hope not. So now I'll jump to, to MATLAB, and uh, I'll actually compute that, okay? Um, so uh, what you have here, um, wait, I'm just gonna explore that. So what you have here, um, here in my current directory is uh, the toolbox that I've put on, uh, uh, I've put available for you, okay? So you have libSVM, which is the uh, the entire toolbox, freely available on the libSVM website. Um, and um, here is the uh, installation instructions um, that uh, I've uh, written up for you. So 
Um, it will detail how to, you know, where to download stuff. Uh, you need a C compiler um, to compile the files from the libsvm if you're on a Mac, okay? Um, and it d which compiler you should use depends on the version of MATLAB that you're using. So here I'm giving detailed instruction. If you happen to have that version of MATLAB with that version of Mac <laughs> and <laughs> that version of the compiler, okay? Uh, uh, yeah. Um, so you download, you need a patch from MATWORKS uh, to make MATLAB recognize that compiler. Uh, and after that, um, you select that compiler and you compile the libsvm toolbox. And now you can run, you can rub, you can run uh, libsvm on your computer. Uh, but watch out. Some of the functions in libsvm, there are really just four important functions here. Some of them um, are exactly the same as some native MATLAB functions in a toolbox called the bioengineer-bio-learning uh, toolbox. Okay, so you don't want to you don't want MATLAB to confuse these two uh, these two uh, functions. So one way to to do that is you want to make sure that uh, in your path list in MATLAB that um, the libsvm folder is in higher priority in the calling list. Okay, so you know how MATLAB works when you call a function, it'll go through the path. Uh, path list and it will select the first one. Um, so that's called shadow, shadowing in the path list. Uh, so you want to make sure that libsvm folder shadows the bio learning folder um, in, your, in your path list, okay? So, so that you use actually libsvm to conduct the, uh, the SVM analysis and not the native, the native one to MATLAB. All right, so you can have a look at that. Um, and okay, so I have my example SVM input matrix that I will load right here. And um, just to show you uh, what I have in there, I have uh, firing rates, which is the first, uh, the first entry, and quadrants, which is um, the labels. Okay. Uh, so in firing rates, I have my trial by neuron matrix. So I have 231 trials and 52 neurons recorded simultaneously. And um, in quadrants, I have the same number of rows, 231. And I have just the information about what quadrant of the screen the monkey was allocating attention to. So these are the two things that I uh, that I need uh, to um, uh, to do my um, my classification. All right. So I've written up um, a script called main script here. Okay. Uh, which uh, which main purpose is to call a function. Call. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That. Yeah. I should have specified that. Okay. Yeah. So I'm. I'm looking at a given integration window. That's correct. I'm looking during the delay period, where the monkey is allocating attention to one target and other distractors are on the screen, and I'm looking at a 400 in that specific example. I'm looking at a 400 millisecond time window, and I compute my firing rates over this this time window during the delay period. Okay. Yeah, using uh, that's what exactly what I do. Yeah, so I slide this 400 millisecond time window um, by 200 millisecond time steps, and I do my SVM on each of these uh, so that I get a smooth decoding accuracy as a function of the trial epoch. Yeah. Um, all right. So I've written this main script, uh, which uh, main purpose is actually to call SVM classify. Uh, which is a function um, written by a um, former student um, of uh, Sam Muslam's lab, uh, Rishi uh, Rajalinga, who's not at MIT. And um, so what he has there is um, a, uh, a function that organizes your data. Um, so once you've inputted the input matrix that I've shown you, that will do a few, few more tricks uh, to organize your data and will actually make the final call to the libsvm function, svm train, svm predict, predict okay? Um, so there are options that you need to select, um, that you need to, to define when you, when you call uh, svm classify. Um, I'm j there are only three, so I'm just gonna go quickly over them. So first, what you can do, that's an option of uh, 
conducting in uh, Fisher uh, linear discriminant analysis on your data before you input it into li uh, LibSVM. And I, um, it, the default is you don't do it, and I actually recommend not doing it, at least in my data. Uh, it, it did not help the classification accuracy, so it's just one more step that you, that you avoid doing. Um, then um, you need to normalize uh, your data before you fit into uh, LibSVM. So uh, the default option is yes, I want to normalize uh, my data. Um, and uh, what you need to do also is to balance the number of obver observations per category. That means that um, if, let's say, I have 200 trials, um, maybe I have 50 trials of condition 1, 50 trials of condition 2, and so on, so that I have the same number of trials per condition, and that would be perfect. But sometimes that's not what's happening. Maybe sometimes I have you know, 80 trials in one condition and 20 trials in the other condition, and that's a problem for, for SVM, okay? Um, if you leave it as, as, as this, um, um, SVM will um, give you uh, inaccurate decoding accuracies that are just really an artifact of the fact that you have a, a, a disproportionate number of observation per classes, okay? Like, it's easy to, uh, to classify um, two categories if 99% of the observations belong to one category, right? You just have to say category two all the time, and you know what, you'll get 99%. That's not really intelligent classification. So that's, that's something you need to control for, but I'll, I'll go further um, in further details in the last slide about the potential pitfalls of, of SVM. Am I doing okay with time? I'm actually taking a lot of time. Yeah, I'm fine, okay. All right, so uh, you specify these three options, okay? And uh, then what you need to do is just to make the call to SVM classify. It will output you two things um, that I will show you um, uh, right now. Um, so I will, so I've loaded my example data matrix, contains two fields, SVM classify, input one, the firing rates, input two, the quadrants or the labels. And then another argument which is important here is called the k-fold, and that, um, that is uh, an information regarding what's the proportion of your data that you want to train on, and what's the proportion of data that you want to test on, okay? So with a k-fold of five, what that means is that I take my entire data set, okay, of composed of 231 trials. I'll take four-fifths of these 231 observations um, to train the decoder, and then I will take the remaining fifth to test my decoder, to test its accuracy, okay? Um, so this is what a k-fold of five would do. Um, there are some... Uh, some theories about what sh what's the best k-fold. Some people think that what you should do actually is to train your decoder on all your trials except one and then test your decoder on that last trial. Um, that's called leave one out, um, cross-validation. But um, k-fold of five, at least in my case, did a very good job. I've tried also the leave one out and, and give, did pretty much the same thing. So, I mean, it's up to you. You run some tests, right? There's no gold standard in decoding. Only thing you want to do is to improve your accuracy. That's 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 what you want. Yeah. What I think is that when you do a K fold of five, yeah. it's actually going to train five times the decoder yep. and test it five times. You do that in principle. You have fresh packets, and each one will be used as a test. Yep. Uh, each time. So this yep. is this has to do with cross validation, and do not underestimate the importance of uh, cross validation. I know that before, like uh, doing some machine learning, I knew about that, and uh, I underestimated the importance of doing that. I thought that only taking a few and testing it and training. Thing that is that this prevents you from uh, let's say that you have some samples that are very very toxic that uh, that you have a bias in the samples that you have. Uh, this prevents you from uh, from calling it to do that and getting like either worse results than what you could get or better results than what overfitting you could get yeah. because it gives the weighted data a part of it. So uh, k uh, cross validation is very very important. Yeah so yeah yeah yeah. So in the toolbox here, you have no choice. You have to carry cross validation. That's how you evaluate the accuracy of your of your decoder. Right, so you train on a proportion and you test on a, on a, on the remaining trials. All right, and then the last term are the options that we specified that just before the three options here. So I'm gonna run this. Um, so options, and then I'll run 100 iterations of the SVM. You'll understand a little bit further why um, why it's important to run multiple iterations of it. All right, so it's busy. It's running. Um, so you haven't seen here, but I'll put a lot of different tests, a lot of different. Um, uh, training and tests, and um, what I come up with uh, are uh, a few things. Uh, first, um, the mean, the average SVM result. So I'm just going to do an average over the 100 iterations, and what we end up here is with a 86% classification accuracy. 
So that's what's cool about SVM is that it actually gives you an absolute number, a confidence that you can have. So here I can say that using this population of neuron, I can predict with 86% accuracy, with 86% confidence, where on the screen the monkey is paying attention to, where on the screen the monkey is allocating his attention, okay, with 86% classification accuracy. So that's an absolute number that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure I make the difference between the two things you just said. Yeah. So, so you're not okay. I, it's it's the first thing you is the first thing you said. Okay. Yeah. So, it's the first thing you said. What what that gives you is when you train your decoder using a subset of these of these trials. What you're able to do using all the time, all the population of neuron at, at the same time, right? So it's not using one neuron at a time, and that's, that's, that's actually why I'm using SVM and why you guys should think about SVM if you're doing simultaneous recording, is that SVM is really using simultaneously the entire population of neurons to make that prediction. It's not using one neuron at a time. It's using the entire one simultaneously making that prediction based on the population code. And um, yeah, so this is the accuracy of those predictions. Um, trying to predict, let's say I have a new trial, I have this monkey seated there, he's in a setup, um, and I'm only looking at his brain activity, only looking at this prefrontal activity, and I can predict, just looking at these neurons with 86% accuracy, where is it on the screen that the monkey is allocating attention? Okay, so that's, that's kind of the logic of how to interpret this, this 86%. Is that, does that answer your question? Uh, n no. Like no. So if there's no information contained in the neuronal population activity, you won't be able to decode whatever, right? So, so non-informative neuron will not yield any decoding accuracy, not better than chance. So here. 86% means that you know these neurons they're probably implicated in some sort of filtering process in prefrontal cortex. Okay? Uh, no, that threshold is you know experimentally defined. You're what? I'm happy with 86. Maybe you're happy with 87. I don't know. Uh, n yeah, I think there you need to compare uh, to gold standards in the. Uh, what other people have been doing. So you compare yourself to the other papers out there. Oh, these guys have been able to predict allocation of attention with 99% accuracy. Ah, damn, I'm not that good. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty much the only way to come, right? Yeah, the person can always compare yourself to change levels. Oh yeah, of, of course, of course, yes. That's a good point. Of course, you need to make sure that your predictions are better than chance, right? Otherwise, you know, just flip a coin and you have a, a, a good decoder. Uh, so yes, you want to compare it to chance. So, so that's the next thing I was about to do. Uh, but b before, before just doing that, um, yep. Yes, yes, it matters. So the more neurons you have, if all these neurons are independent predictors, they carry additional information, they contribute to the population code, yes, adding more neuron will lead to better classification accuracy. So let's say I, I randomly sample only 10 neurons from this this population of 50 neurons, I will have a very a much lower decoding accuracy. Yes, so the more neuron you have, uh, if they are task, uh, uh, res task relative, I mean, they, if they are doing something meaningful in the task, yes, it will increase the decoding accuracy. Yes? Yeah, so Fred would probably be able to tell you where in LibSVM you can get that weight assigned to every predictors. Um, but what I do personally is I, the second thing you said, I will also run in SVM on every single neuron independently and try to see how single neuron SVM uh, performs and then I will classify single neurons based on, based on that. But there, there's another way to do so. Maybe you can talk about this yeah, later. Uh, 
sem or rich samples are used as the support vectors. Yeah. But uh, so these contain the loudest FM formations. So if you have like uh, uh, samples that lie away from the Richmond boundary that will be way to the S, yep. but are, are still very formidable. Uh, if I was to do that, honestly, I would go uh, more with the um, with the PCA in the end. Okay. Uh, with the melding itself, uh, uh, discriminant analysis. And with the discriminant, it's a narrow method, so it's, it, may, it might not be as good as that, but this, you extract the hydrant vector, and uh, by looking at the, the, the Are the good more predictors, more yeah. Okay. In, uh, and then you look at the population as a whole at one, one step, uh, only uh, as a with a single uh, event. In a single step, you look at all neurons. Yeah. But uh, I mean, you can do like you like you do by uh, doing uh, SVM on every single neuron. Yeah. So there, there's no, uh, there's no limit to how many neurons you can input into SVM. You can go from one to a thousand. Um, but when you use one, well, you get the prediction accuracy of that single neuron. Okay. Good. But you probably have some effect of some. Of course, and that's what we hope. Uh, yeah. They're not so completely independent. Yeah. I, I would honestly, to for answer to answer this specific question, I would look into like uh, uh, doing an LDA okay. and, and look into it. Yeah. Okay. So that means this game by does you can't tell whether a given neuron is part of this class. You, you can tell which neuron. Uh, yeah, because let's say you're you're from the six hundred population, you take one from five hundred thirty. No, so, so, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, but, uh, so SVM is robust to noise, up to a certain level, I will talk about this just a little bit, uh, a little bit later. So if you add task irrelevant neurons to your SVM, um, like neurons from another region, or in prefrontal cortex, what we find often is that there's a whole bunch of neurons that don't seem to be doing anything in that task, well, these guys, they don't, they won't hurt your classification up to a certain level. Yep. So what is that level? Let's say you have one neuron which is very yep. specific and 99 neurons which are more specific. Yeah, I, right? yeah I'll show you. I have a simulation, uh, and I'll, I'll show you that those numbers uh, maybe just after the presentation. Their speeds are coming, so I, I need to make sure I finish in uh, 10 minutes. Okay, so I can, t I can answer more questions just after the talk. All right? Um, all right, so first thing I've shown you here is the decoding accuracy. Okay, we've got an 86% 86 decoding, 86 decoding accuracy. The second thing you want to look at is the confusion matrix I've told you about, okay? So I'm just going to compute this confusion matrix, and I'm going to plot these results, okay? Um, so first thing I want to plot is um, the distribution of decoding accuracies, okay? So I've run 100 iteration, and um, so what you see here is that, well, it seems like the average decoding accuracy is around 86, but you can also see that the standard deviation is pretty low, right? It seems to, uh, like the decoding accuracy seems to cluster um, quite closely around around 85 or 86. Why yeah. Do you have the same I've run 100 iterations of the SVM decoder. So with the same data. With the same data. So it's a probabilistic uh, method that will not yield exactly the same decoding accuracy every time you run it. Um, so that's one explanation. That's one explanation. But there's another, another, uh, another thing, too, which is when you balance observations, what you end up doing, let's say I have four conditions, 30, 30 trial, 30, 30, and 40. Well, what I have to do is to downsample the, f the biggest category, the 40 trial uh, um, category, to 30. And if depending on which trial I select there, then that will also lead to some more variability. Oh, that's what I was going to Okay. <laughs> Good. No, you won't either. <laughs> it's probabilistic there too. There is some sort of uh, maximization operation there that's a little bit probabilistic. Okay. Um, so distribution of uh, of decoding accuracies depending on the iterations. Here, I just want to show you that it seems to the standard deviation is pretty low. Uh, I think I have the standard deviation here. Um, so that's a 1.5 percent um, standard deviation. It's not not so bad. Um, and um, the confusion matrix. So here, um, if you remember what confusion matrix is about, um, so these are the true states of the world and these are the predicted states of the world. So in one, 
here, that means that the monkey was actually allocating attention to the upper left quadrant of the screen. And um, in those cases, well, the, the decoder has predicted correctly that the monkey was allocating attention to that region of the screen 90% of the time, okay? So this is how you, so you see you have very high likelihood on the diagonal terms and very low likelihood in the off-diagonal terms. So that's a pretty good decoding accuracy, okay? But sometimes what you could see is that there are some very specific mistakes. Uh, let's say that uh, most of these mistakes here would seem to be like, in that case, in state of the world number four, it seems like it's either classifying correctly or misclassifying four as three. And that maybe relates to the fact that three and four are on the same Emmy field, right? They're part of the same Emmy field, so maybe that tells you that uh, you know prefrontal cortex has a harder time dissociating two stimulus in the same ME field as opposed to stimulus across two ME fields. Okay, so this is the kind of uh, information that you can get from looking at the type of errors that your decoder makes. Okay. Um, all right. Last thing relates to testing it against chance. So to test it against chance, all you have to do is a permutation test. So I've just activated this line, and this line, all it really does is to permute the labels, okay? Randomly permute the labels, so that actually the associations between the state of the world and uh, the neuronal activity is completely shuffled, okay? They, uh, I've just shuffled this association, so when you train the decoder, the decoder d is not supposed to make any sense of that data. And when you test such a decoder, what you should get is a chance performance, okay? So uh, I'm going to um, clear all, reload the data, and then do exactly the same thing, but with that line active, and I'm going to replot everything. And um, what you see here is a randomly distributed confusion matrix, and you have uh, a distribution of classification accuracies around, around 25%. Okay, so that tells you that these results that you got beforehand they're not due to chance, okay? But of course, you need some statistics to also to compare distributions. Um, all right, so that's that's it for the uh, for the example. Um, you can do that uh, at home uh, with uh, the toolbox if you if you like it. Uh, so I will get back to um, the presentation and just end up by um, um, telling you a few of the potential pitfalls of using SVM, okay? So the first thing that you need uh, always to make sure is that you balance your number of trials across categories, okay? Uh, and um, the, the script written by, by uh, Rishi is actually uh, doing this for you, okay? So even if you don't think about doing it, uh, you can have a look into the function SVM classify, but it will look up the number of trials you have per category, and if it seems like if there is a non-equal number of observation packet per category, it will randomly sample from the biggest uh, uh, category uh, to down to down sample uh, everything to the lower um, um, to the lower uh, category smaller category um, so that's number one always need to make sure uh, you do that if you don't do that you'll get very good decoding accuracy and it won't generalize to a new data set so you need to make sure that uh, you balance uh, second thing, you need to run multiple iterations to sample different trials. As I said, if you balance from uh, from uh, uh, from all, ca if you balance the number of trials across categories, then you need to randomly sample from different trials all the time. So run multiple iterations, and also that will give you some sort of a idea of the error uh, in the distribution of decoding accuracy. So as you've seen here, we had a standard deviation of one percent. Well, that's informative. If I had a standard deviation of uh, 30%, then that's not exactly the same result, even though I would have had the same mean, right? So we need to have kind of an idea of how reliable the results you're getting um, from the SVM uh, by running multiple iterations. Um, three, very important point, you n should never use the same trials in the training and in the testing set, okay? Um, so trials that you select to train your decoder should never be used as the te in the testing phase, okay? Uh, that will, if you do so, that will lead to, to some sort of overfitting. Um, the model would be perfectly trained to decode such trials, and then if you te take the same trials to test its accuracy, of course it's going to be a lot better than what it would have been if you get a new data set in there, okay? So that, that's, the call, uh, that's the problem called overfitting, and you need to make sure you don't overfit your model by using a true cross-validation procedure, which implies testing on a different set of trials. So that, 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 in my case, with a K-fold of five, that meant training on four-fifths of the trials 
and then testing on the remaining fifth, okay? I don't have an overlap. There's not a bunch of trials that I used both for training and for testing. It's a different set of trials that I use for testing. But if you use the bootstrap technique to get some um, error measurement on your distribution, um, then um, watch out. Bootstrapping implies uh, randomly sampling with replacement from your distribution. Uh, that means that in a bootstrap operation, you can sample two times the same trial, okay? And then you put that into SVM. But if you have two times the same trial, then there's a probability that one trial would be part of the training set and one trial will be part of the testing set, which will lead to an overfitting, okay? So don't bootstrap your distributions with replacement before using uh, SVM. And last thing, which relates to noisy neurons, no neurons that do not carry information, uh, well, SVM is robust to these guys, okay, um, up to a certain point. So if you have, a, let's say, 30% of your, of your data set that includes neurons that don't seem to be task-related, don't seem to be doing anything, SVM, SVM will do a good, thing, uh, a good job at ignoring those um, uninformative predictors and just focusing on the, uh, on the informative uh, predictors, okay? Um, but up to a point, um, meaning I will show you, well, I, I, didn't, I don't have a slide on this. I can, if you want to have a look, I can show you further on where is that tipping point where at some point there's too much information in your SVM is, is choked and cannot do, uh, can't do any, any more uh, uh, classification job. Um, yeah, so these are the five potential pitfalls. Um, watch out. Uh, take these into consideration. Most of, them, most of them are taking into account in the lib SVM and in the, the function from, uh, from Ushi. So you don't have to worry about um, doing any of those mistakes um, because it balances automatically your, your trials across category. Run multiple iterations. That's what you do. Uh, it never uses the same trial. It does a, a good cross-validation. Do not bootstrap. That's, 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 on, your, that's your, on your hands. And make sure you have some neurons that seem to be doing a, something relevant to your task. <laughs> that's also on your hands. Um, all right, so uh, if you have any questions or comments, um, you can uh, email me at uh, this, uh, this address or we can uh, just uh, talk a little bit more about it. So thank you very much for your attention. Do you guys have any questions right now that you'd like to ask? Yeah. Uh, no, I haven't run these tests. No, okay. I've used only SVM. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, even if you are experienced, so you use the kernel to yeah. Yeah. Do you have a like a selection of all the different kernels? Um. Yes. Um. Pragmatically, you use the kernel that does the best decoding accuracy. <laughs> Try different kernels and uh, choose the one that does the best job. So that's the thing in decoding is that the gold standard is really performance. So you just want to maximize your performance. You're not cheating by choosing such kernel or, or, or another, ker or another kernel. When you're using cross-validation, your test of performance is accurate. So just do whatever uh, gives you the best performance. Yeah? How do you know which pitfalls? So what do you think about pitfalls? So, yeah. Um, so, yeah. If the K-fold won't, won't lead you to, uh, the, the, cho the choice of K-fold won't lead you to overfitting. Um, uh, but some people think that some K-folds are better than other, and Fred is an expert on that question uh, also. So you can ask them that question, but I know that a K-fold of five is kind of a standard K-fold, and the other K-fold that people like to use too is the, the leave one out K-fold, where you use all of your trials except one to train, and then you test on the last one. That, that, that is equivalent to, let's say, I'm, I'm, I'm using all the information in the world to train my decoder to make a single prediction, right? So that, that's what the leave one out uh, uh, K-fold with logic is. Yeah. No, it doesn't, no. Because as, as long as you're testing on a completely novel information, um, that last trial uh, was not part of your training set, then it's a valid prediction. Yeah, it's just that you have trained a lot before making that single prediction. Yeah, Ben. So what it will do is it will, f so let's say with a K-fold of five, it will split all your trials in five uh, equivalent chunks. Mm -hmm. um, it will train on four of them, test on the five. 
it'll do that once, okay? So let's say train on one, two, three, four, test on five. And then it will on, it, and it give you, I mean, in test on five give you a certain decoding accuracy. Then it will do an op the opposite thing. It will sample, it will train on five, four, three, two, and then test on one. Okay. And it will do that five times so that it will be eventually tested on every trial that you input, okay? But never will a trial be simultaneously be part of the training set and the testing set. So we'll do that five times separately, okay? To make sure that every trial has been both trained on and tested on, but never at the same time, mm -hmm. okay? So in terms of iteration, even if you have the same number of trials in the same condition, just the fact that you can change what um, time you train on. Yeah. So um, the number of iterations that I've selected here, uh, uh, I've selected 100 there, and that's, um, uh, that is not um, it depended on depending on the k-fold. Th that so if you select the k-fold of five, even with an iteration of one, you will have five results. Okay, you'll have a decoding accuracy using that first chunk, that second chunk, fourth, and fifth chunk, right, third, fourth, fifth. So uh, you'll get five different decoding accuracy. You'll still get an average uh, over the five one. If you do 100 iteration of that, then really you would get 100 times five um, decoding accuracies. Okay. Yep. Um, I just heard a minute ago that there's also the um, information flow associated. Yes. With, um, do you know anything from that computational perspective? Because I know, like, even in coding, we're on like this kind of thing. We have like a person who do like. So I don't know about computation power. It seems like both SVM and um, information toolbox, in theory toolbox, run superbly on my MacBook Pro 2010. <laughs> um, so I, I, I think that, you know, computationally wise, both of them are, are they're, 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 I mean, they work, right? They, they're, it's fine, it goes fast. I ran 100 iteration in less than three seconds there. So I think, I think it's fine. But information theory have some limitations when dealing with extremely large data set of neurons, um, and we can talk about that a little bit later, but uh, that's one reason why uh, you should use decoding rather than information theory when you have very big uh, samples of neurons. Okay, yeah. Um, the question about trials, do you use trials in the decoding process? Yeah, so, no, so the 25% decoding accuracy uh, is due to chance. Um, so if you have a, uh, a dice with four, uh, no, that doesn't exist, a dice with four <laughs> surfaces. Let's imagine you have some, then you'd probably get 25% decoding accuracy using such a dice to predict where the monkey allocated attention on the screen.